Is okay? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you can you can look at it from from two angles. First of all, you can try to understand how the topology will affect the dynamics. Do certain properties of the graph, like its degree distribution, I don't know, like its presence of triangles, and so on and so forth, affect the diffusion. And this diffusion could be some random walk dynamics. It could be some epidemic spreading type model, like SI type of model. It could also be some uh, some synchronization process. It can also be written that way. And that would be a first type of question that the people ask. The second one would be: Is it possible to use the dynamics in order to 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 uncover some interesting structural patterns that are present in the graph. Can we use random walks, for instance, in order to find some useful information which is hidden in a very large graph? And that's something that we are going to focus on today. And just the most basic example would be PageRank, that many of you have heard of, which is just about that. It's about using some random walk dynamics in order to define some centrality measure <coughs> on the graph. And basically, and, and that's something where you see the power of dynamics. Dynamics can help you at finding some centrality measures that are defined globally on a, on a graph. So, so just here, so, so I'll, I'll give you, a, so here in this talk, what I'm going to be interested in is really about using dynamics to find some structure. And these structures will be modules and clusters and graphs. So, so here, so here it's just a, a short uh, a figure where, where, where we, with some co-authors we tried to 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 to, well, to to give a taxonomy of the different methods that the people can have in order to find clusters and modules in networks. And actually, there are different well, there are different tools that exist with their own advantages, with their own drawbacks, but also very often with different based on different principles and with different goals. And when you think about trying to find clusters in networks, so what, what, what would that be? So you have a large graph, and you have to, to imagine that this graph is not purely homogeneous. You will have some dense groups that are present in the graph. That would be, for instance, well, that, that would be, in this case, you have the, the, the very famous Karate Club network, a social network. But this network is, roughly speaking, composed of two groups with, with just a few links between these two groups. So that would be a typical example of a graph composed of two communities. And when you, when you look at the algorithm existing in order to find these groups purely from the topology, trying to find these rectangles versus circles purely from the topology, but there are different types of philosophies that exist. So the first one are some, some, some algorithms that are based on, on the notion of cut, of cut. So what is the cut? Let's assume that you define a certain network, and you say that you want to find something where there are as few connections between the two groups. Well, this number of connections between the groups is something called the cut in graph theory. What you try to do is to find the best way to divide your system into a certain number of groups, such that you will minimize the number of links between the two groups. And there are all sorts of algorithms, especially classical algor algorithm, uh, algorithm, algorithms sorry, from, uh, from, graph, uh, from graph partitioning that are based on this notion of minimizing the cut in a graph, it's usually by fixing the number of clusters and the size of the clusters. Then there are some clustering perspectives. In the clustering perspective, what we'd like to do is more try to find groups of nodes that are densely connected with each other. And this is something that you can do directly from the graph itself. So you, have, you take the graph, you try to find groups of nodes that are densely connected. And that would be what modularity would do, Newman governed modularity. But you can also do that after projecting your graph onto a certain embedding. You have a graph. There are different ways by which you can, well, you, you can project this discrete object, which is a graph, on a continuous space. So you do, you, you do an embedding of your graph onto a space. And then once you've been doing this embedding, then you can use k-means clustering, for instance. You can use classical ways in order to do the clustering. And that would be something that we did here. We had a graph. We've been projecting it in a certain space. And there, what you, then what you can do, for instance, is use k-means and find that there are two clusters. And in that case, you're not really interested in the fact that there are few connections, but more that the, the nodes are close to each other from a structural perspective. Then there is another type of approach that the people have been using, which is quite popular, is uh, a stochastic bulk modeling approach. So in that case, what, what, what you have in mind is the fact that your graph can be modeled by a stochastic block model. And so what is a stochastic block model? 
Well, you assume that you have a certain number of types of nodes. In that case, you would have three types of nodes. And then what you say is that, well, actually, given these three types of nodes, I define certain probabilities between the different types. So here I would have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. I have nine parameters, three by three. By three. And, and these three, uh, nine parameters tell you the probability that there is a link between a node of a certain type and a node of another type. And now the game is trying to see if it's possible to find, given this model, the best parameters that explain the graph that you observe. So you have a graph and you try to find the parameters. And these parameters are which nodes belong to which group and the values of the different probabilities between the groups. And you try basically to, well, it's, it's a classical model inference problem. You have a model and you try to find the model that best explains the graph that you observe. And that can be done by likelihood optimization, typically. And in that case, well, basically what you have in mind is that your graph is generated by some sort of a random model of a network. All of the connections are random, but there are different types of nodes. And what, and what matters, every time, all of, all of the edges are independent, independent random processes, but there are higher likelihoods for certain edges to appear than others, basically. And these tools are, I, uh, well, I, I think they're quite nice, in particular because they offer you some statistical foundations. And there have been quite a few works in recent years trying to, well, basically showing that on certain types of models, they, well, they, they tend to achieve to very good results. But what I am personally more interested in is more like looking at modules, more from a dynamic perspective. So I'm try, trying to understand how, well, this interplay between the fact that when you have modules, the module affects the dynamical process. And because of that, because it affects it, you can find back the module itself. And actually, when you think about the difference between here and here, well, here, it's a model-based model -based approach. It's, it's an approach based on, 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 on a model of a random graph. And you try basically to find the graph the model that tells you why you observe a certain network. While here, we don't have a model, we have a network, and we try to understand the impact that the network that you see has on some dynamics. So it's more like, this explains the why, this explains the, what are the consequences of what you observe. OK, so, so dynamics and network. So basically, what we, what, what we're interested in is when you think about some dynamical process, for instance, a random walk and then trying to, to use the trajectories of the workers to find to find vectors. So now, well, there are, there are some there are different ways to do in order, in order to, to, to exploit these trajectories of workers to find the clusters. One of them that I will not describe in detail is something called the map equation. It was designed by, uh, by Martin Roswell and Karl Bergstrom, where what they try to do is they try to encode the trajectory of a walker uh, in a way that is as efficient as possible. So they try to minimize the code length, which is necessary to encode the trajectory. And, and the way they do is well, they, they, use, they exploit the fact that when you remain inside the cluster, you stay there for a long time. And basically, what they define, they define different dictionaries for the different clusters. And they say that, well, if you find a good cluster, well, basically, you can exploit that in order to use a few symbols to describe what happens inside the cluster. And just once in a while, you will have to say, well, actually, I'm leaving this cluster to go to, go to another one, and so on. So, and that's, I think, a very nice one. So here, what I'm going to describe, because I will need it a bit later, is a notion which is more some sort of, a, some sort of a, uh, an autocorrelation type of measure. Well, basically, again, we will try to, well, we will try to, to measure the fact that, well, if you think about a graph like this, and you, th and you think about the trajectory of a, of a walker, well, intuitively, it's going to stay for a long time inside the red before going to the green, if the partition into red and green was wisely chosen. In that case, you have a bad partition, and then what will happen is that you will switch very rapidly from the red to the green. While here, if it's wisely chosen, you will stay for a long time inside the red before you go to the green. And basically, the way it, it is encoded, it's through a notion that was first introduced by Jean-Charles Delven, Sofia Yadiraki, and Mauricio Barona. And where the notion was that they define a certain quality function for the partition of a graph. 
So you, you can imagine you have a graph, you partition it into green, blue, and so on and so forth, uh, as many colors as you wish. And then you say that the, the, the quality of that partition is going to be uh, measured by this notion of stability. Stability has a certain parameter, T. And stability tells you that basically the quality of, the, of a partition is given by the probability that if, so you, you, you think about a, a random walker moving around, you assume your random walker is at stationarity, at equilibrium, and then you say, okay, I, I, I take a walker, I look where it is, and I estimate the probability that it will be inside the same cluster after some time. That's a probability, the probability that I am in the same cluster initially and after a certain time t. And I compare that probability with what would happen if I let this small t go to infinity. And of course, because you assume that the, uh, the, the dynamics is, is ergodic, you, you can assume that you will lose the, the initial conditions. And then basically, this thing is simply the probability that you have a walker initially, or that you take two independent walkers, basically. So, so this notion, well, it has so, so, some nice advantages. So, so the first one, so, so if, you, if you look at, at, at it on a non-directed network, so here you have a typical Markov chain defined on your network. So the probability of being on node i at time n plus 1 is given by a certain transition matrix times the probability of being on node j at time n. And then you can see that if the graph is like it's connected and not, not bipartite, so it, it's gonna, this dynamic is going to converge to... Okay, I thought that this thing was ringing. But sorry. It's not my phone. Uh, so basically, uh, this goes to equilibrium, and the equilibrium is going to be, in the case of an undirected network, to, to this solution. So the probability of being on a node is proportional to its degree. And if you go to the, the previous definition, well, this stability at time one is going to be given by a certain sum where you, of all pairs of nodes, we impose that the two nodes must be, because of this delta, inside the same cluster. Otherwise, it's going to be a zero. And then what you compare two things. You compare the fact that this is my initial state. This is where I'm going to be. After, well, that's the action of one step. And this thing basically tells you that I am in the same cluster initially and after one step. Because I sum over i and j, the initial condition, and where I am just after. And here, that's what happens in the case of independent workers. And that would be what happens when t goes to infinity. And when you see that, you see that this notion of stability, well, actually, it's just equivalent to, to this Newman-Govan uh, modularity that has been used quite, quite a lot for the last 15 years, in, in, but defined in a completely different way. So that's the first interesting part. The second point is the fact that, well, OK, so modularity and stability seem to be connected, but that's not the case when you have a graph which is directed. So when the graph is directed, then things become very different. The main reason is the fact that when the graph becomes directed, then while well, finding the stationary state, what well, is it's the page one, so that's the dominant eigenvalue of this matrix there. But that's not anymore something that can be estimated locally. It becomes a global, in general, it becomes a, a global property of the graph. And hence, you will have that this stationary property is given by a certain, well, a, a, a certain vector of, uh, of, uh, of centralities, basically. And you have, an, you have an expression here, which is now different from the usual modularity as it's been uh, general, uh, generalized for direct networks. And the main difference here is the fact that when, you, when people think about modularity, they think about, they think about counting edges. the count edges between different groups of nodes. So everything is purely local. Everything is purely about counting well, counting the, the edges inside the group versus what you would expect if things were reshuffled. Here we don't think about counting edges, we think about following walkers. Mm -hmm. And because of that, well, you, you can see the appearance of these global properties appearing in the definition. And that, that can have some strong impact. For instance, if you look at, at a graph like this one, well, this is a graph where, so basically you have some sort of cycles around, yes? And you have strong links that go between these cycles. Well, then, if you if you look at what would happen for uh, for modularity, modularity would find the the strong links. It would put together these groups because they are connected by a strong weight, which is here. 
If you look now at this notion of stability, because stability is not purely interested in strong links, but about the flows of workers, now, actually, modularity is going to find this. So it's going to find now this kind of group of nodes where the flow is going to be stuck for some time before going to the next one. So you see that because of these different philosophies, at least, well, this is, of course, like a, a well-chosen example, but it's an example that shows you that this different, what well, these different philosophies can give you some very different results at the end, partly because the notion of module is defined in different ways, either in terms of we look for dense links, many links inside groups, or we look for groups of nodes where the flows are going to be stuck for some time. Okay, and well, this is not very important, uh, and this is. Not so now, okay, another difference that, that, that arises for, for this notion of stability is the fact that, well, there is a parameter time, and that parameter can be used. And so now, instead of doing things in discrete time, we, we look at the, uh, well, the corresponding case with uh, continuous time. We again assume that you go back to undirected network because it's a bit easy, easier. So in the case of continuous time, Undirected networks, this is the session solution. But now you have a certain measure of the quality of a partition, but that is something that's going to depend on, on time. And this parameter, well, as we'll see in the next slide, it has a ni nice interpretation because this time parameter can be seen as some sort of a time resolution, uh, a, a re resolution parameter that helps you finding clusters at different uh, character characteristic scales. When time is very small, you can easily show that the communities, the, the best partitions, the ones that optimize stability, will be those where the communities are single nodes. It makes sense. You don't have the time. It, when time t equals equal to zero, you don't have the time to move. So each community is a single node. When you actually, when you when you look at the small t, you linearize for small values of t. Actually, you find back some, mod some sort of general modularity measure that was introduced by Richard and Walnut a few years ago. And then, actually, when you go to small, uh, to large values of time, well, actually, what you can show exactly is that when time goes to infinity, well, basically, you will have that this expression here, when, when time is very large, it can be well approximated by its, the contribution by its dominant uh, eigenvectors, basically and all of the others are going to die off. And then basically you can show that the best partition will be the one which is associated to the uh, second dominant eigenvector of the transition matrix, which is something that's usually called the field vector of the, uh, of, of the graph. Mm -hmm. And so in that case, the best partition is composed of two modules. And so you see, you see that this time parameter really goes from very fine-grained until very coarse-grained. And here's just a, like a, a, an example where we have, well, this is a very basic example where we have that so we have groups of, strong groups of two, a bit less of four, and so on and so forth. And you can see that when you look at stability, well, for small values of times, it's going to find the, the single nodes. And then there is a crossover, it's going to find the, group, the groups of two, then the groups of four, and then the groups of eight, I suppose, and then it's going to be like that until, uh, un until the end of, uh, of times. Uh, so this is not really important. Uh, so now, so just now from, from a computational perspective, it's, it's very nice to, to have a time parameter because it, it, it gives you some freedom. It, it allows you to, to choose the scale at which you, you will look for clusters. Now the problem is that, well, how do you choose the right value of time? And that's not an easy answer. And, and, and for the little story, it's, it's kind of funny because uh, initially, when you, when you look at the papers 15 years ago, the first papers uh, about the notion of newman governed modularity, newman governed modularity was first introduced because people thought that it would give you the best number of clusters automatically. That was the way it was, it was, the, it was sold. Well, actually, well, it's been well understood since then that, no, it's not the case. New, uh, like newman governed modularity, it has hidden somewhere a scale at which it will look for clusters. And this scale might not be uh, adapted to the actual clusters that are present in the graph. And that's, for instance, uh, uh, related to the notion of resolu resolution limit, 
that was introduced by Fortunato and Barthelemy a, a few, like 10 years ago. And so here, the problem is that, well, very, very often, when you will try to optimize this notion of stability, well, basically, well, it, it can happen that you will be confronted to a very rugged landscape, and that you will have many partitions that, have, that can be very different from each other, and still have a very comparable value of, of this notion of, of stability. And so basically here, what we've been what we do in practice, well, that's what we do, I don't know if it's the best way, but we try to find values of time where actually the, the graph, uh, well, when you, when you think about the, the landscape that you try to optimize, well, basically, the, it will be as, not, uh, well, no, not as rugged as possible. You will try to find a place where you will have well one defined maximum, and this, or that, or, or that m most of the, most of the local maximum will have, r roughly speaking, the same structure. And so the way we do is, in practice, for instance, we try to find a certain notion of robustness at different values of time. And to do so, what we do is, so here, well, for instance, for each value of time, we, we use, so optimizing stability, like optimizing modularity, or most of these, most of these problems, well, it's NPR problem, so you need heuristics in order to optimize the quality function that you define. In that case, we use uh, the so-called Louv algorithm, which is a, a greedy algorithm to, to do the optimization. And it's a greedy uh, algorithm that basically, it is a purely deterministic algorithm, except for the labeling of the nodes. So if you change the label, you could get different results at the end. And what we do here is that we run the algorithm 100 times, changing the, the labeling 100 times, and we look at the end, what are the number of clusters that we find, and if these clusters are the same or very different from each other. And so here we try to look at the robustness of the, of the measure according to the way we, we do the optimization. Another way to do would be to try to, uh, to use one single optimization, no, one optimization, but with uh, 100 versions of the graph, where we add just a bit of noise on, on the edges. So we slightly change the weight of the edges, or we add a few edges. And the, and the idea would be that just, just, just a few modifications of the graph do they lead to strong differences in, in the cluster that we find. And another one would be, we look at the value, a certain value of time, and we look at what happens just for the next values, hoping that things won't change too much. And basically, on, on, on quite a few examples, what you observe is that these values, well, this, this is an easy case. So this is a very easy case. It's a football club, which is extremely easy to, uh, a football club network, so really very easy to solve. But we can see on this very easy case that actually, indeed, so this is a certain notion of robust, uh, lack of robustness. So when you have lack of robustness, very different solutions because of noise. Well, you, you get a lot of differences in the results that you get at the end. When you get something very robust, it means that now, even if you have some, uh, so, some noise added to the system, you always find the same solution. And here you get something again where you, you have a lack of robustness appearing. And, and these are the solutions that can be seen to be the most relevant ones. But here, this is an extreme scenario where, where basically the difference between the different solutions that you have goes to zero, so it's perfect. In practice, it will not be as nice as that. And, well, this is, again, a situation where here it's a benchmark with different levels, a bit like the one I showed before with groups of 2, 4, 16, and so on. And, and you can see that, again, you will have the, the system finds that be, when you are between, between values of times that are between the, the good scales, you will have a lot of noise. But actually, inside, when you are on the right scales, you find a good, a good level of robustness. Mm -hmm. But again, this is an easy case. But here it's a case which is less easy. It's, 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 it's data taken from protein. But again, even if it's not as easy, well, you can see some dips. You can see some information. So here, that would be a protein where you, well, we know that there are different, different scales that can be important. And when, what we can observe is that, for instance, but the residues that are known to be well uh, chemically important, well, they will appear, they will be extracted from the method, and they will be extracted in this case when you have a, a well-defined dip, meaning that suddenly 
things were, uh, were not robust and they become a bit more robust. It doesn't go to zero, but at least there is a dip. And in that case, well, this is what happens for well, the large scale structures. Mm -hmm. Here, things are well defined. Here, well, it's a bit more difficult to say, right? There seems to be a small dip, but it's, it, it, it's, not, it's not as good. Uh, okay, so, so now, so everything so far was, was about uh, usual networks and dynamics on networks. Yeah. Now the thing is that, so what I'm going to try to, to go through until the end of, of the talk is, well, okay, so so far we've been using like, basic random moves in order to find information. And the idea is that we'll, we'll, we try to look at this, the pathways of the random worker and try to exploit, exploit these pathways to extract some useful structure. Now, in what we might have in mind is that these pathways are a bit related to the actual dynamics that takes place in the system. And that's what we're interested in, typically. We are interested, we're not interested in random motion, if the motion is not random. And what, what I'm going to show here is that are some attempts where, where we try to enrich the dynamics to make it more similar to what happens in real data mm -hmm. and to use this enriched dynamics exactly in the same way in order to find the dynamical groups, groups that are defined by the dynamics as we, is, uh, as we see it in practice, basically. Mm -hmm. And actually, well, there are, and, and, and the two examples that I'm going to focus on are situations where, where the dynamics will be described by a higher order amount of processes, not anymore like a, the first order Markov process that I did before, but higher order Markov processes because it could be that these are more uh, are closer to what what takes place in reality. And the other case would be about temporal networks, where you would have that now you you would have a diffusive process, a first order uh, diffusive process, but where the timings could be given by some 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 general renewal process. Basically. So the first part was really about so higher order dynamics. So in the case of higher order dynamics, well, well, basically, okay. So as I said, we use so what we've been doing before. We, we use random flows to find information. But the question would be, what do these random flow? Well, look a bit like what happens in real life, or do the flows that we observe uh, are they completely different from these random flows? And, and, in, and, and this is something that so we've been exploring in this work with mainly with Martin Roswell and uh, Andrejal and Cicinetti, like two years ago. So, so here the idea was we, we've been looking at, first of all, we've been looking at many systems where we could measure some, something diffusive. And, we, and what we've been looking at first, first graphically, was about, well, this is a trivial example, but it, it, it works well. First of all, we've been looking at the way people are traveling around by taking planes. But of course, if you think about me traveling while well, I came from Brussels, came here, and then the next flight is going to bring me back to Brussels. So it's likely that if I look at my, if, if, I, if I was coming from New York, going to Chicago, well, it's very likely that where I'm going to go to after is going to be New York. Yes. What, and so it means the same is if I was on, from San Francisco, going to Chicago, I'm going to go back to San Francisco. And it's very likely that if I, if I come from New York, Passing by Chicago, I will go to Atlanta because if I wanted to do so, I would have taken a direct flight. So here we see that the way uh, why this is what would happen if we had a, a random worker. This is what we observe in real data, and of course, this is almost a trivial situation because we know that well, people don't move like random workers. But still, if we want to find clusters based on the motion of people, well, then it means that. We might have to go to do better than this. We might have to include this information in the modeling of the, of, of the random dynamics. And this is another example where, in that case, we looked at like citations of uh, well, path, well, path of, cit of citations between journals. So let's say you take a paper published in Science, you look what it what it cites, and it might cite papers from ecology. But then if this paper cites paper from ecology, well, it's very likely that it will himself be cited afterwards by ecology, while and not by uh, a journal of uh, economics. So it means here that, again, if you look at the flows of citations between the journals, you will have something where these flows are not random like here, but they will behave like there. And so there might be that ecology and evolution go a bit together, but this paper will not be 
cited by something which is very different. Yes. And again, so you see that these flows are different from what we would have, what we would have for random dynamics. And so basically, so, so what we've been doing, well, we've been collecting quite a, few, a lot of data. And then basically, uh, well, and no. So something that we always wanted to do, but we never either find, found the time or get the proper data, is that if you think about how information diffuses between people, well, the way information diffuses between people, again, if you have some in information coming from some colleagues going to you, and you ask well, the question, to whom are, are you going to talk about it? It's very likely you're going to talk about it to your colleagues and not to people from your family. So again, if you think about information diffusion, it could be modeled by using this framework where you would incorporate this higher order information. If you know where the information comes from, you could predict where it goes to. So things are not purely first order matter. And so what we've been doing, so we've been, well, designing some codes, first of all, to take path for information, extract either for, well, what, what's needed for a first order Markov model or what's needed for a second order Markov model. And then basically, uh, in order to build these kind of different types of transitions that would be for what happens for a first order or second order. And what, the first thing that we checked was, well, how good, well, do we need second order information in order to predict what to observe? And here, what we, what, what, and what we can show is that, yes, in, many, in the six systems that we looked at, you need it in order to, well, there is a statistical difference uh, that justifies the use of a second order, a second order information in order to model proper, properly your, the, the, the trajectories that you observe. Okay, so that's nice. So first of all, you see that what well, this information, well, you can reject the hypothesis that the trajectories that you have are generated by first order Markov model, but how different are there? Well, they, they can be quite different. For instance, if you look, well, so, so, okay, so what we do in practice is, so when you have a first order Markov model, well, you will have, what you, what you will have are all of the nodes and the connection between the nodes. When you look at things from a second order Markov modeling, well, it's equivalent as looking at it from a first order Markov in an extended space where now you will have that each edge of your initial graph will be a state and you look at the transition from one edge to another edge basically. So it means that you go from a certain number of nodes to a larger number of nodes, so it increases the size, it's not always good. But what you can see is that well, some type of behaviors are, are going to be very different. So for instance, for, I don't know, like for, for the, for, we looked at the way emails are forwarded between people, well, you will have that for those, you will have, that as well. Well, well, for most of them, you would have that the return probability is going to be much higher than you would have in the first order Markov model. But even sometimes, you will have that uh, uh, the three-step three return is going to be also higher. And that would happen, for instance, when you think about processes taking place on spatial networks, spatially, because in that case, it's quite easy to, to do a return step. And that's what happens, for instance, for traces of taxis that takes place in cities, where you would have that, you will observe many triangle, tri triangular connections that are just due to the underlying ge geometry of, the, of your system, basically. So, very good. So, you, you observe that the trajectory are not first order Markov. You observe that actually there are some striking differences between the two. So, now the idea is to try to use that in order to, in this methodology that I described before. And so, and, and, what, what, and one funny aspect is the fact that, so now what we do, basically what we're going to do is, we're going to consider the, the, the system from a second order Markov perspective. So transition between, from edge to edge. So now the states of our systems are going to be the edges. And what, what we're going to do is define, for instance, the uh, Markov stability for, on, on, on these edges, on this, on all of these edges. So what we're going to try to do is to partition the edges of the system based on, 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 on the flows between the edges. Mm -hmm. And what is funny is that actually there have been a few attempts where people tried actually to, to partition the edges of a graph because it has a nice, uh, it, it has a nice implication. When you partition the edges of a graph, it gives you automatically overlapping communities for the nodes. We have a node that can belong to different groups. 
And that's typically what you observe in, at, a, at a certain resolution in social networks. In social networks, I myself belong to different groups. My work group, my, uh, you know, like a, uh, my sports group, my family, and, so, and all of them are different. And actually, all of my connections are somehow defining the groups that are associated to. And so here, what we do is, so what we do is, we take a graph, we, and then we, we go to this second order Markov description, where instead of looking at the transition, transition from A to C, C to D, we look at the transition from the edge AC to the edge CD to the edge CE, and so on. And now we define on this extended space, we have a usual random walk basically, and we can try to optimize stability and see what we get. So, so here it's, it's an example where we looked at this information from, from the way the people are traveling around in the US. And so here what we do is, so we've been basically optimizing, well, partitioning this second order map of space, but using the, the usual first order map of dynamics. So it means we assume that there is no memory, but we model it on this extended space, basically. And we define stability, we optimize stability, and we find a certain, well, we find a certain partitioning of the edges, implying that nodes belong to different groups. Yes. So we do that, and we also do that for the, using the, ex, the, 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 the second order Markov process. Well, here it seems that there is a difference, but with, in order to quantify the difference, it's just interesting to look at the fact that uh, the first important difference is that when you use actually the higher order flows, you tend to observe that airports belong to more communities. So for instance, here what you will have is, so that would be for the M1 data, that would be for the M2 data, and what we did was for each node, we looked at, so each a node can belong to a, to a certain number of communities, with a, so 50% to the first community, 10% to the second, 5% to the third, and so on. And we measure the entropy for each node, and the entropy will be very small if you have that you, your, all of the nodes belong to one single community. It's going to be large otherwise. And what we observe here is that actually, if you use the first order Markov dynamics, we have a certain distribution of these uh, of these entropies. Here, another distribution that actually, well, there is, we have that nodes here tend to belong to more groups or more homogeneously than here one node tend to belong to this group. So again, I think this information brings you something new to your, to your analysis. So maybe I'm going to finish about something else. So, okay, so I think this second order of market information provides you some, some Additional information about the clusters. Good. Now, what about the timings between 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 uh, between the events in the system? So here we were not not, not interested anymore in in the memory that are taking place in the pathways as we did before, but more in the memory in terms of the timings at which the events take place. And the things that for the last ten years there have been many like all sorts of all sorts of information where people observe that when you look at dynamics on, on networks. Well, basically, the, the events are not, well, the, the, the dynamics of the, ev of the events is not trivial. It's not given by a trivial Poisson process, neither is it by a non-stationary Poisson process. It tends to exhibit some bursty behavior, some self-exciting behavior. It tends also to, to, to lead to some correlations between, uh, different, between different elements in the system. So it means that, well, there is a richness in the dynamics of of the graph. And here what we've been doing is, well, we've been trying to, to look at the, one of the most basic models you can think of to incorporate this, uh, this, the richness of the dynamics. And we, can, we considered uh, some generalized continuous time random walks. It's a classical model from statistical physics. And what we've been doing, so we, we looked at the way something is diffusing, except that now we have an extra information about the fact that the timings are themselves random variables. The timings at which events take place are random variables. 
So not only are you interested in the, tra the transition, the structural transitions, but you're also interested in this extra information about when things happen. And what's nice is that when in that case, you can, so we have a new parameter. We have, we have two parameters. First, we have the transition matrix telling you where you go when you decide to go. The second one being the, uh, well, the, the waiting time distribution. And if you take this waiting time distribution and this L matrix, which is the Laplacian of the graph, which is purely encoding the, where you go uh, after each step, well, you can write down like, exactly an equation for, for the dynamics of, uh, of the random work process. And this equation looks good when you go into the Laplace domain. And in the Laplace domain, where S is the Laplace variable, you would, you would get an equation like this one here. Mm -hmm. So funnily enough, well, that's, that's an equation which has a tradition in statistical physics again. So it's, it's related to the Montreal Schlesinger equation from the 60s. Except that at the time, this equation was defined on regular lattices or continuous spaces. Mm -hmm. While here, we do it in a situation where it's more like it, it would be the equivalent of this equation for Markov chains, basically. We have a discrete system with arbitrary transitions, and all of the math remains the same, but and we arrive at a situation where we have an equation with this Laplacian matrix that can be generated. And what's funny is that because we look at it from a in a different situation, you, 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 you'll see we'll be interested in different questions. So if you go back to the works of Schlesinger and Montreux, they were interested in an anomalous diffusion. And in that case, anomalous diffusion is really something that, that is interesting when you have an infinite system and you're interested in basically the mesoscale dynamics, how, what happens for long times, but not la long enough that the whole space is covered. Here, we, it's not what we're interested in. Here we have networks. Networks have a small diameter. Net, 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 networks are finite. So we will not be interested in this kind of anomalous diffusion. We'll be interested in something else. And so just also to complete, the, so this equation, when if you go back into the temporal domain, it will give you some integral differential uh, equation. It shows you that it's, um, well, it's non-Markovian. What happens now depends on the whole history in general, except if the whole of delta t is an exponential. And in that case, the temporal dynamics is Poisson. And in that case, the whole equation here simplifies into a differential equation, and you get the usual dynamics. So, so ju just to go back to the first slide, it's kind of interesting that, OK, so what we've been playing with here is, so as I said, most of the time, people are interested in what happens on the top. Here, somehow, we didn't play too much with what happens on the right, because there have already been all sorts of work trying to understand what is the impact of a complex structure and dynamics. What we play with is more with what happens on the left. And because we have here an, an operator here, which is usually call, called, uh, well, in dynamical systems, the, the causal operator. Why causal? Because it's an operator that tells you how the effect of your neighbors translates into a change of your own state. So, so one possible way to translate this, this effect <coughs> into a change would be a differential operator. Here we have something which is different, and that was this operator defined in the Laplace domain. And it's kind of interesting to see that, on, at least on this side of the equation, in the field of networks, not too much has been done trying to understand the impact of, of, of general operator, operator here on dynamical processes. And, and what is nice is that, so you can write exactly this kind of generalized Montreal Schlesinger equation. But as I said, now, well, we have a finite system. And so when you have a finite system, you could try to understand, for instance, how much time do you, do you need in order to to reach stationarity. And so in the case of, uh, well, and, and that's usually called the mixing time. You start from a, a certain initial condition, and you ask the question, how much time do I need to cover the whole, well, to, to reach stationarity? And this mixing time, if you look at it in the usual uh, dynamics here, it's, it will simply be given by the inverse of the second dominant eigenvalue of the matrix here. So this matrix here gives you the time scales that you need to reach stationary. Well, actually, when you have this, this thing here, it's a bit more complicated. 
what you will have is a, it's a competition between the, this second dominant eigenvalue, which is called the special gap, and statistical properties of your temporal, uh, your waiting time distribution. And typically, the variance of it is going to play a role, but also uh, the shape of the of the tail of the distribution. And what, what you can see here is that so we, we've been doing some, so you can have an, an exact formula, but here I've just shown an example of what it leads. It's the fact that, so here it's an example where you have a certain networks with either strong communities or no communities at all. So in that case, purely structurally, you would expect that it's difficult to go from one side to the other. So, and that's a case where the spectral gap is small and the classical mixing time would be very large. It takes a long time just because of structural constraints to go from one side to the other. Well, here, that would be the opposite. The mixing time should be fast because it's very easy to mix. And so what we looked at is what happens with a waiting time distribution that can either be an exponential, a discrete time distribution, Erlang law, some sharp power law, and a soft power law, so a power law with an exponential pattern. And here in this, so here, in, what, you, what, what we do is, first of all, we compare here with this color code. If you go faster to mix, as compared to what happens with an exponential distribution. And the exponential, because it's the Poisson case. Well, of course, here, it's always blue, because you compare with yourself. Yes. But you can see that, well, when you have discrete times, well, discrete times tend, tend to speed up the, uh, the diffusion. You would have that, again, if you have Erlang, it's going to speed it up as well. If you have some sharp power low, it's going to slow it down, and can slow it down quite a lot. And again, for this other power law, it, it's going to slow down the diffusion. So now what you can also look at is that, so I told you that there is, that there is some sort of a competition between different factors to define the time it takes to, to diffuse. And actually, there are three factors. One is purely structural, the spectral gap. And two are related to the shape of the distribution, a burstiness parameter, which is basically related to, well, to, to the width of the distribution, and the tail, which is about now the, well, the shape of the tail. And we can see, what we can see is that, well, in all of these situations, the dominant factor is going to be the structural one. But actually, in that case, for instance, you will have a whole regime here where what matters more, what is, the, what is dominating the time will be the burstiness parameter, while in a certain regime, now it's going to be the structure. So here you see that when the structure is very, very, when there is a very strong bottleneck between the clusters, but actually that's going to be what dominates, whatever. But, but at some point when the bottleneck is not strong enough, now what determines the time it takes to reach stationarity is not anymore the bottleneck, it's going to be the shape of the distribution. Okay, so, so maybe um, as a conclusion, I don't know exactly where I am. So I wanted to talk about something, but uh, I'm struggling with, with the figures. <laughs> we have a lot of results, but no figures. So it's a bit uh, complicated to show. But so basically, I just wanted to, sh to say that, so, so far, what we've been interested in is, is purely dense communities. We try to find clusters, dense communities, communities such that when you have a random worker, you stay there for a long time. What we've been working on for some time now, and we hope to, to conclude this, is trying to, to, trying to find what's called disas disassortative communities. And disassortative communities would be more something where, uh, like that, where you might have that there are strong links, not along the diagonal, but be between different groups. And that's something that we didn't consider at all. And in order to do so, what we've been working on is, we've been trying to, to work in situations where we try to cluster nodes based on the response after an impulse that you put on that node. So you, you imagine a graph. You put some impulse on a node, and you look at the response. You will say that two nodes are similar if the responses are similar. And, and when you think about it, it doesn't imply that they're in the same cluster. If you take a bipartite graph, for instance, well, you will have that if I put an impulse on two nodes in the sa on the same side, well, they will move in unison, and therefore they will be said to be similar, even if they are not connected with each other. So here we have this kind of notion that we've been working on, and there are all sorts of niceties to it, but 
I hope to be able to talk about it more, but time flies, and I don't think that I have. I think it's better to go for lunch. So, so, so basically, so. But, but hopefully, it's going to be on the archive in a month. That's the plan. <laughs> so, so keep, so keep, keep a look. Next, your next vacation. My next vacation planned for uh, I don't know why, but we like it very much. So hopefully soon. Uh, uh, so, so basically, so conclusion. So everything I talked about today was really about this interplay between dynamics and structure. And so that's something that we've been working on. So mainly with so Jean Charles Delven and Mauricio Brauna from Imperial College. So with this notion of mark of stability. So here, what I talked about, about higher order networks, it's, it's small works that we've been doing with Martin Rosvang, trying to incorporate this higher order modeling into the dynamics that you, then, that you can use them in, in, in the standard algorithms for networks. The impact of burstiness, well, it's, it's a work that we started a long time ago with a student uh, named Till Hoffman, with some works, but what I presented today mainly was a collaboration with Jean-Charles Delven and Louise Rocha. And this thing that I talked about it very shortly at the, at the end, about these non-assertative communities, some sort of like a, well, in, input response functions and similarities between the responses after inputs on different nodes. But it's a work that the, which is in progress with Michael Shaw, and we hope to finish it soon. And also, I just wanted to advertise, uh, for those of you who don't know, we spent a lot of time with uh, Naoki Masuda to try to, to write a book on Temporal networks, and it's not really, a, but it's a book where we go from really from the basic of stochastic processes. We talk a lot about renewal processes, about random walks, generalized random walks, a bit of the things that I talked today, but really in the context of temporal networks. And I must say, now he has made very nice contributions. So just for him, you should, you should have a look. And uh, and I also just wanted to add for those of you interested in networks and communities. Well, of course, well, there is the review paper of Fortunato, which is a bit dated, but he had a, a recent one, uh, a few, I think, last year. But maybe for those interested more in, in, into the stochastic block models, as I said, there have been quite, quite a few interesting results in, quite recently, including the use of non backtracking random walks in order basically to find, or to, to, or to, to find the clusters up to a limit, up to a, a theoretical limit after which it's not possible to find them anymore. And th there's a stream of works now on trying to use this non-backtracking on the works to find clusters. And more generally, there have also been quite a few works on, on this network inference, designing algorithms, practically uh, fast algorithms in order to find clusters from this modeling uh, perspective. And key persons would be Peck Soto, for instance, also Mark Newman, uh, Aaron Close, and I think that's it. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Well, do we have uh, questions or comments? Or... Yes. <laughs> I can ask them. Um, your method of the random workers, how efficient is it compared to other community uh, structures and finding methods? Uh, from a numerical point of view, but basically, uh, from a numerical point of view, it will depend on the heuristics you use, obviously. Mm -hmm. So things that so 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 I was involved in the development of this Louvain method, which is a classical one used to optimize modularity. So basically, okay. So so when you think about, uh, yeah. I just go there. Yep. Uh, okay. So. For instance, for modularity, if you want to optimize modularity, so it's NP-hard, so you need heuristics. Mm -hmm. And the two classical ways that you, people use in practice would either be to use some spectral methods, and, and then it works relatively well. It's well mathematically justified, I think, mm -hmm. but it, but it requ requires the estimation of eigenvectors of very large matrices. So typically, it's what people would use for systems going up to 10,000 nodes, something like that. Mm -hmm. And after that, then people would use greedy methods. And then greedy method would be the Louva method, for instance. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look about, if you think about stability, well, stability, if you, if you take the full version of it here, well, you need to estimate an exponential of a matrix. So you need to estimate the spectral properties of the matrix as well. So again, that will work relatively well until 10,000 nodes, typically. But then if you want to go higher, then honestly, the only solution is to use some linear approximation of it, 
and then the linear approximation, it's exactly mathematically equivalent to this Richard and Bournemouth. And that can be optimized by Louvain or by any kind of greedy method. So it means that up to 10,000 10, nodes, you can do it completely. And honestly, from I prefer to do it that way because then you really look at pathways of different lengths because you have this exponential of the matrix. So you really look for, for, well, for, for, for pathways of different lengths between nodes. While when you do the linearization, you just look at one step and not more than that. Mm. But when you don't have a choice because of size constraints, then you have to do this way and to use uh, greedy methods from, from the, the, the exactly the same ones that you would use for uh, optimizing modularity. Mm. And what's nice is that you don't even need to, you, you just need to change well, it, it's possible to use exactly the, you can use it, you don't have to rewrite the algorithm, you can use the algorithm as it is, you just change a bit the input, send it to the algorithm and it gives you the right result. So you don't need to rewrite any algorithm. And for instance, well, what I mean for instance is that so, uh, for instance, if you look at this, this notion here, okay, stability, I said it's different from modularity in the case of directly networks, that's true. But actually, so stability is different from modularity. But stability is exactly the same as the modularity of another matrix. Mm -hmm. And so it means here is that, so if you do some pre-processing, and this process, in that case, it's simply looking, symmetrizing a certain matrix. And that matrix is the flow of probability between nodes <coughs> at stationarity. If you do this pre-processing, then optimizing that is exactly the same <coughs> as maximizing this. And then you can use any kind of uh, modularity optimization, not on the original graph, but on another graph which has been defined more from a dynamic way. Um, uh, so there are many underlying methods, models, for example, here is around the world. You can modify that and put any model you want to think of. You have algorithms, you have stability, you have EF world, but you can. You have more in the literature. You have many different methods and models. So the, the amount of uh, methods, uh, variations of all these things is amazing. And there is no match to compare them. So there is no way. And when you do the comparison, you have the paper by Santo, for example, but there are many doubts. This is, I mean, so the feeling I get at the end is, OK, academically, this is very interesting. And, and, and the, the insight is very powerful. But with respect to the modularity communities and all that, it's like, hmm. No. Uh, well, it, it, it's fine when I have to do some statistics, but if I want to do something for, for, for a real system and really go there, if this gene or this set of genes are the ones, uh, yeah. No, no, well, it's certainly a self exciting uh, field, certainly. So it which has been feeling itself and growing. So, uh, well, I think that I, I still think that there are some. In, so, and actually, it, it was actually the reason why, we, at least, we tried. So, because there have been quite a few large reviews on community detection, like two by Santo, for instance. And that's why what we try to do in this review paper is not to say which one is best, because I don't think there is a best method. There are more like methods searching for different things. And, and if you already understand that, that's actually you search for something different, it can help you. Well, let, let, let's take the example of a, a social network. Well, if I, if, I, if, if I use a method like this one, what I might try to understand is, can I find some uh, hidden attributes that explain why I see connections between people? And so for instance, let's say that I'm trying to do some inference about attributes of people, but then, Personally, I would go for methods like those because, or well, I think those or those actually, but those because you would have, you, you would try to find, uh, to find back some attributes that can explain statistically the connection between people. You try to explain why you observe the things. If you're not or interested. Otherwise, you could think that social networks are there is for sharing information and you can run some yes. propagation and try to identify where the information remains, yes. which could be another process. Exactly. And then it really depends on what you look for. But at the end, the two things may be different. Uh, the, the, truth can be very, the, the truth can be different. You can really get very different results depending if, if you do this, especially if you do this and that, you can have very, very different results. 
because you search for something different. And so that's why I think it's important to have in mind what you search for before you do the, the analysis. But now in practice, also, as you say, like we use random walks, you can use the, the dynamics. Personally, I am a proponent of trying to use a dynamic which is as close as possible to, to, the, reality. to the reality. And if you don't know, you, you go for, well, you follow Occam's rule and you take it as simple as you can. So if I think about something which is more related to epidemic spreading, I will, I will use a matrix A instead of T because matrix A allows for this kind of multiplicative process while so Laplacian doesn't. So approaching more towards uh, pattern formation in networks at the end. So, sorry? So it's approaching to pattern formation in networks. Yes. Because pattern formation at the end is telling you what well, this is a set of clusters which are in the same state according to that dynamics. So you yes. know the dynamics that is responsible for whatever transmission factors or whatever that, that you will find the genes that are expressed simultaneously. So that's more or less. Anyway. No, no, completely. And then, and then again, but then when some very practical person, like I don't know, asks me, uh, okay, very nice, but now what do I use? Which is what they want to. Uh, well, typically, uh, what, and if they want, don't want to think too hard, because, uh, well, then typically I would tell them, well, at least try two or, or three methods that are based on different principles, and tell me if what you get at the end is roughly the same or very different. And if you get something which is roughly the same, it might be good enough for what you, what you need to do. And so typically, I would tell the people, well, use well, one moderate optimization method, the map equation, which is known to work well. And if computation is feasible, you could use, for instance, toxic book model, because toxic book models are quite expensive, computationally. And if at the end you get, roughly speaking, the same results, that's good. And if, if not, well, then you need my help. <laughs> So yeah, but so typically you try to use very different philosophies because then it's also a certain notion of robustness. Yes, if there is a very strong signal, hopefully these uh, all of these subtleties are only well will remain interesting for academics. But if then there is a strong difference, then you need to think harder and then you need to need to choose the right method. Okay. Any? No. Maybe we try to find some time for. Private discussions. Thank so, you. thanks very much. Thank you.